If you want to go way back in the history of Goldman Sachs, they started very, very modestly uh, as foot peddlers. That is somebody who has a wagon and he is walking around and selling goods off of his wagon. They built their business on, on what is called commercial paper, which is, is nothing more than, than an IOU, a short-term IOU that's, that's used by uh, people in seasonal business like, like retailers. They were willing to take on retailers as investment banking clients. The big uh, firms like J.P. Morgan and like, uh, like Kuhn Loeb at the time, they would turn their nose up at uh, at doing business with Sears or doing business with Kresge or doing business with, with uh, Macy's. Those firms thought that the investment bank should be limited if not to railroads then really uh, major industrial corporations. On the other hand, Goldman Sachs was willing to take that business. And, the, and of course that sector of the economy grew rapidly over the years and uh, they grew with it and then they just branched out into all these other other uh, financial services for institutions, for um, uh, corporate clients. Goldman Sachs is very, very good at what they do. Almost everybody at Goldman Sachs worked weekends, and almost everybody at Goldman Sachs worked nights. I was too busy working to, to have much socializing. We were trained to be like client kamikazes. We had a kill for the client. It's clearly a culture that cultivates ruthlessness. Remember, for Goldman to be winners, there had to be losers. And as we know now, there were thousands and thousands of losers. Goldman Sachs, you're the worst. Time to put the people first. Goldman Sachs, you're the worst. Millions of Americans have lost their jobs, their homes. In the last three years, we've knocked down over 500 homes in this neighborhood alone. They have crashed the national economy. We wouldn't be here but for the fact that there was such a collapse in the housing market. We aren't perfect. To think that we're being charged with fraud, of all things. This record-setting penalty reflects the egregiousness of Goldman's misconduct. I don't think that businesses like Goldman Sachs ought to be engaged in conflicts of interest. It's that clear. It's not whether a conflict of interest exists that is important. It's how you deal with it. In the face of a lot of noise that has gone on, we've stayed the course. The concentration of power in the hands of Goldman Sachs is even greater than it was before. There is disproportionate representation in domestic policy by people who are within the Goldman sphere of influence. They are aggressive. They are a potent competitor, but I think they stay within the lines. They have got the most formidable internal culture of commitment and teamwork of any organization in finance in the history of the world. Our most important assets are our people, our clients, and our reputation. The reputation is the most difficult to restore. Our clients' trust is essential to us. It is why we're as successful a firm as we are and have been for 140 years. Near the tip of Lower Manhattan, a stone's throw from the Hudson River, stands a 43-story tower of glass and steel. It's Goldman Sachs' new $2 billion headquarters, and it serves as a symbol of the bank's success. That success and what's behind it is being questioned like never before. Today, Goldman finds itself the poster child of Wall Street excess. The firm paid half a billion dollars to settle fraud charges brought by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And when it comes to public perception, an NBC News Wall Street Journal poll taken shortly before that settlement found Goldman Sachs' approval rating was worse than BP's in the midst of the Gulf oil spill. I'm David Faber. 
In the next hour, we'll explore how Wall Street's most profitable and powerful bank has found itself the subject of both professional admiration and public scorn. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. I wanted today to talk to you about Goldman Sachs. Um, Goldman Sachs, in my opinion, if there were two words that, that uh, were um, the most important two words having to do with finance and in turn the cryptocurrency um, market, those are the two most important words that there are in my opinion. And the reason is that Goldman Sachs is it, Goldman Sachs rules the world. So you need to go ahead and you need to go ahead and understand that Goldman Sachs runs the world. They own the world. They rule the world. And I will show you. I'll back that up with with what I'll show you here shortly. But first, I wanted to start by telling you a story that actually happened to me about a month ago. I um, I live in a in a small town in Georgia. And I, but I bank with one of the top two uh, largest banks in the world. And um, but there is in my town a local bank who has the majority of the market share in in my town. Well, I was the, the, the branch of the large bank that I bank with only has one branch in in this town. I was asking the branch manager the other day, I said, why do you only have one branch? I said, why you guys could own this entire market. And his reply to me was that every time that, that they go, his, his uh, bank goes to try to get approved for another branch. The, uh, the city council in our town is controlled by the local bank that owns this town. And I was sitting there thinking, now how crazy is that, that some small uh, regional local bank could keep everybody out of this town and even keep a huge, large mega bank out of this town that way. But it's true. That's, that's how they control the market. And so the reason I bring that up to you is that we need to we need to face the facts about about who is running the show when you when you go and you uh, are watching a clip of of um, these SEC chair people or any kind of people that are in any form or fashion related to the politics of our country or the politics of the world they have agendas and they have people that they serve and people that they answer to and what i'm here to tell you is that goldman sachs is the if there's one one company in finance that these guys are all beholden to in politics and otherwise it's goldman sachs and i want to go over that with you uh for a minute um this is just an, one article that i found and you could find multiple and it was about, it says, why do former Goldman Sachs bankers keep landing top slots at the Federal Reserve? Well, for years and years and years, Goldman Sachs, this is part of the, this is how they make all the money. This is how they keep all the money is that they control the power the same way that in my local town, this one particular bank is able to control this town. They do it by controlling the politicians and it's no different. In fact, it's probably magnified at the uh, federal level and the world level even more than it is in local towns. But this is the way the world works and you need to go ahead and accept it because this is this is how things work. And it's okay because you and I are invested in our XRP and it's the smart it's the smart play and these people that control the world are smart people and I'll go through that too. Um so anyway, Goldman Sachs, yeah, they, they control Federal Reserve, you name it. Federal Reserve, SEC, they've got their hands in it. And I'm going to show you. This is a list of former employees of Goldman Sachs. 
And I'm just going to skim this and kind of tell you, just so that you understand, keep in mind, every day you're watching TV, you're watching CNBC, you're watching um, interviews with people that are at large companies, and uh, you're watching interviews of, of people that are in, in our government who are supposed to be in uh, roles of power, whether it's at the SEC or the Treasury or the Federal Reserve, um, all of these people. So I want you to be thinking about that. And I also want, while I'm reading this list, I also want you to be thinking about who some of the companies and the banks and the central banks that Ripple is partnered with uh, that you hear as I go along. First one, Guy Adami, CNBC's Fast Money. He, he worked at Goldman Sachs. Um, I'm going to just mentor uh, this Eric Asbrink, Minister of Finance of Sweden. <laughs> um, Deputy Prime Minister of Egypt. I won't even try to begin to say his name. Um, but let's keep going. Stephen Bannon. Anybody know that name? That he, he, he was in the Trump administration, former executive at Breitbart. Um, White House Chief of Staff, Joshua Bolton, Portuguese, Portuguese economist and banker, Antonio Borges. Um, I'm going to keep going down the list. CNN host, Aaron Burnett. I, I hope you're starting to get uh, the feel that Goldman Sachs people and people that are affiliated with Goldman Sachs they don't just rule the finance world, but it's the media world, too. These guys are everywhere. Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England. Ooh, there's a name. Um, I believe Ripple is working with the Bank of England. And former governor of the Bank of Canada. Let's keep going. Um, founder of the street.com, Jim Cramer. Does anybody know that name? I've talked about him before in all of his conflicts of interest. Um, I'm going to keep scanning this, and, and when something jump, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, William C. Dudley. So you, be thinking, when, when you see a name like this, uh, do these guys, do they have any obligation? Can Goldman Sachs pick up the phone and call these guys and ask for a favor? You better believe it. United States Secretary of the Treasury from 1965 to 69, Henry Fowler. Futures Trading Commission, Chairman of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, 2009 to present, per, to present, Gary Gensler. Keep going. Um, as we go down this list, uh, Under Secretary of the State of Economic, Business, and Agricultural Affairs, 2007 to now, Jeffrey Rubin. There are a couple that I wanted to make sure I pointed out. I think they were down here. Lawrence Summers, Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, 1999 to 2001. Gene Sperling, Director of National Economic Council, 2011 to 2014. Former Chairman and President of Wachovia, Robert Steele. Uh, but if you go, if you go through, uh, go up and down this list, what you will find is the people, um, and I missed this one, Chief of Staff to the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, 2009 to present, Mark Patterson. Henry Paulson, he was during the financial crisis, former United States Secretary of the Treasury, 2006 to 2009. Okay, these guys, this is how this game works. And it's important that you understand this, but, and, and I'm going to tie this into what we're going, on, going through right now. April 27, 2010. A dramatic confrontation between Washington and Wall Street. The scene, the Senate's permanent subcommittee on investigations. Goldman Sachs's highest ranking executives are being grilled about whether the firm profited at the expense of its own clients during Wall Street's financial crisis. It's a low point in the long history of America's most storied investment bank. Good morning, everybody. Today. Committee Chairman Senator Carl Levin of Michigan doesn't mince words when confronting Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein. You shouldn't be selling junk. You shouldn't be selling crap. You shouldn't be betting against your own customer at the same time you're selling to them. Following a long investigation, Senator Levin claimed Goldman Sachs lured its clients into billions of dollars worth of deals the bank knew were likely to go bad. Look what your sales team was saying about Timberwolf. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. I, I didn't say that. Who did? Your people, internally. 
Come on, Mr. Sparks. Well, Mr. Chairman. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal? You use the word shitty a lot of times on national television. I'm telling you, that was quoting Goldman. They were describing something internally to themselves as crap and selling it to customers. They didn't seem to be troubled by it. They said to us, you guys sitting up there don't understand the way Wall Street works. Well, let me tell you, I do understand the way Wall Street works, and that part of it is totally unacceptable, I believe reprehensible, and needs to be reformed. Well, they think they did right by their shareholders, who, by the way, also include their 33, 35,000 employees. They think they were actually the firm that best navigated the worst financial crisis this country's seen since the 1930s. Well, maybe there's 35,000 uh, employees or shareholders uh, that benefited, but there's uh, 200 million Americans that lost. In the hearing, CEO Blank Fine defended his bank's treatment of clients when it sold them securities in the housing market. You are betting against the very security that you're selling to them. You don't disclose that. I don't think our clients care or they should care that you what are betting against are. the security you're selling to them and you don't think that's relevant to a client the people who were coming to us for risk in the housing market wanted to have a security that gave them exposure to the housing market and that's what they got the unfortunate thing is that the housing market went south very quickly and so people lost money in it after every major financial crisis, it's the winners who really get the heat, not the people who've wiped out. Professor Neil Ferguson is a financial historian at Harvard. He's written extensively about the role Wall Street's banks played in the financial crisis. Do you believe that Goldman Sachs and other investment banks know they're operating within the law, but outside the boundaries of what an average person would consider to be ethical? We mustn't fall into the trap of saying in the wake of a financial crisis, this has happened because the bankers are bad people. They've actually knowingly behaved badly. Uh, it's not really been the consequence of, of moral depravity. It's been the consequence of excessive complexity, of herd behavior, and not just by a few bankers, but by a whole electronic horde of investors, including, frankly, us. Nonetheless, for many, the hearing crystallized a lingering suspicion that Wall Street's leading firm somehow gamed the system to ensure it would emerge from the financial meltdown relatively unscathed. In 2009, less than a year after it received a $10 billion bailout from the government, Goldman made $13 billion in profits, cementing its standing atop Wall Street. The firm's history and unique corporate culture help explain both its success and the reasons why it's come under such widespread criticism. Goldman's rise in power and prestige begins not with its founding in 1869 by Marcus Goldman, but with, of all people, a high school dropout from Brooklyn. Let's look at Jay Clayton. Jay Clayton, as SEC chair, akin to a fox guarding the hen house. Let's look down here. Former, uh, let's see, Goldman Sachs go-to lawyer, Walter J. Clayton, former chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. F uh, for the chairman of, in other words, they just put him in. Um, but he's the go-to, he was the go-to lawyer for Goldman Sachs. All right. Now, let's get to what we're dealing with here currently. And that is things such as exchange traded funds trying to get approval by the SEC okay now sorry if you are uh, if you're wanting to believe that your SEC or your Federal Reserve and all of these different parts of your government are somehow just making decisions based on what the best decision for the time is that's not how this game works these guys are making decisions based on who's in the club and who's not in the club and these guys are on the outside of the club in, as compared to the Goldman Sachs and the guys. What, what you need to understand is this is the second time that these, these Winklevoss brothers have been rejected. I'm not saying that one day they won't be approved. They will be. But it won't be until the, the stamp of approval or the phone call is made from the Goldman Sachs level people because they will make sure 
that they have got their ETFs in place or have their money in place before any of this ever happens. And so, in my opinion, uh, e even if even if Goldman Sachs and some of these larger companies, maybe J.P. Morgan would be considered in that club too. Um, me, me, even even if behind the scenes they're they're creating their own vehicle investment vehicles for cryptos uh, behind the scenes or or through other companies, they will be in on this one way or another. They'll be in on this, and I'm going to show you another way they're going to be in on it. But um, I wanted to go over this part right here. This was from uh, one of my favorite Twitter guys at Bank XRP, SEC Securities Exchange Com Commission J Chair Jay Clayton testified at a House Financial Services June 21, uh, 21st, 2018. And this was a, a clip where uh, this uh, representative, Warren Davidson, actually asked the SEC chairman about Ripple specifically and how there were lawsuits pending and why are you, can't you guys go ahead and weigh in? Well, the answer to that is it's not a coincidence that that uh, the SEC chair people have not come out and said one way or another. There are monetary reasons, believe you me, behind the scenes that they are not. If they were going to declare it a security, they would have already done it. But there are monetary reasons, and it has to do with the powers that be that are holding this back. And if you just think about it for a minute, think about the buildup. Think about the money that is to be made in XRP uh, as a result of leaving this hanging out there for a while. It, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if the people at Goldman that make these calls are, are setting up their ETFs, setting up all, all of their buys behind the scenes and getting everything right and intentionally doing this as a marketing ploy to maximize the return. Anything's possible with these guys. They, there is nothing new under the sun and they have been running the world for, for hundreds of years, the same type of people uh, behind Goldman Sachs. And this isn't their first rodeo, as we say in the South. The year was 1956. Don Larson pitched a perfect game in the World Series. Grace Kelly became a princess. And five foot four Sidney Weinberg became the biggest man on Wall Street. As Goldman Sachs' senior partner, Weinberg had masterminded the largest stock offering in history when the Ford Motor Company went public. It was the biggest deal that Wall Street had ever seen. And of course, coming after the Second World War and the Depression, it was all the more important a deal. Charles Ellis, a longtime consultant to the firm, is the author of The Partnership, The Making of Goldman Sachs. He says Weinberg's personality was the key to his rise from janitor's assistant to corporate titan. So how does a guy with, what, a seventh grade education have, a, have the acumen that at the end of the day, I think he served on more boards of directors than probably anybody in the history of corporate finance. He had a tremendous capacity for connectivity with other people. It was impossible to not like being with Sidney Weinberg. Long before anyone had heard of networking, Weinberg was practicing it. Even the executive in chief called on him for advice. Well, you're very kind to call me, Mr. President. I'm at your disposal well, anytime. I want you to give me some suggestions and ideas and come in and and try to help me, because no me. one man can do this by himself. I will give you everything I got. But within Goldman Sachs, there was some concern about its savior. Former Chairman John Whitehead was once Sidney Weinberg's assistant. He was getting older, and I recognized that nearly 100% of the business that Goldman Sachs did was his business, where he had the contacts with the company. And what would happen to Goldman Sachs after that? Whitehead not even a partner at the time, proposed the unheard of, a unit that would actually go out and solicit new business. Calling on companies was not something that was done in investment banking circles. The companies came to see your firm. The new idea was a success. Goldman added scores of clients and established a new industry standard. Sidney was able to retire graciously, and we didn't lose a single one of his clients. Now, did he ever come to you and say, you know what, Whitehead, that was a good idea? Never did. <laughs> Never did. When Weinberg died in 1969, he was succeeded as senior partner by Gus Levy, who gained a reputation as the hardest working man on Wall Street. 
He soon had all of Goldman Sachs working just as hard. I retired because I really wanted to manage money. And Hedge fund pioneer Leon Cooperman started his career at Goldman working for Levy. Yes, the guy was a shaker, maker, a doer. Gus Levy was in there 7 o'clock in the morning with two secretaries working with him around the clock. His life was the business. But business wasn't everything. Levy helped build a tradition of charity that continues to this day, pushing Goldman employees toward philanthropic work. His philosophy became the firm's. Gus Levy always said he wants to be long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Do the right thing by a client and everything will work out. And I think that was the culture of the firm. I wanted to show you this to, to kind of m make that point as well. If you remember a, a, a little while back, this is from uh, May 15th of uh, this year, a little while back, Goldman Sachs backed Circle. Okay, Circle is, is the uh, crypto uh, company that is backed by Goldman Sachs. They announced that they were going to introduce a crypto version of the U.S. dollar. Well, let me ask you this question. If going back to the ETF, ask yourself this. If Goldman Sachs is backing a, a crypto version of the U.S. dollar, do you think that Goldman Sachs might also want that crypto to be included in, in ETFs that are created? Could, could it be that this particular crypto, when it, when it comes out, they, they want it to be included in, in some of the, the first ETF ever created. Maybe they want that to be done. But you can be assured that they want it to be done. Now, I want to tell you another little story about um, back in December. Let's rewind to December when the market was going crazy in XRP. XRP had shot up to like $3.50. Uh, I think it peaked around early January. Well, I was talking to my brother who lives in Little Rock, Arkansas. And my brother told me that he was talking, this was right in the middle of all of the hype. He was talking to a friend of his who was a financial advisor in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he told me that his friend was literally shocked when he found out that my brother even knew what Ripple XRP was. The guy was shocked. And the guy proceeded to tell my brother that all of the financial advisors uh, at his firm were beating down the doors trying to get into XRP. They had all, out of all the cryptocurrencies, they had looked at all of them. And these financial advisors immediately came to the obvious conclusion in the entire cryptocurrency space that anybody with an ounce of common sense eventually comes back to. And that is that XRP is far and away by a long shot, the most important world-changing digital asset that there is and will be. And so all of these guys were trying to get in and they couldn't get in because if you remember, there were all kinds of log jams to getting into um, the digital assets at the time. Well, guess what? This pullback has allowed a lot of financial advisors and major wealthy people and Goldman Sachs type people. Guess what? the pullback has allowed these people to do and is allowing these people to do. It's allowing them to get in. It's almost by design they're able to get in now because December, I've said it before, December scared them. December was the moment that they realized this crypto thing is not just for nerds behind their computers. This is for real and it's time for us to take it serious. That was what December represented. And I've asked many people that, ask, uh, that I know I've been asked many times by these people, friends of mine, who know that I've been into this for a long time. Why did you not sell any of yours in December? And I tell them all the same thing. Because I know what I own and I know the stage of the game that we're in. And like I told you yesterday, I think um, we're in the first inning of a nine-inning baseball game. I don't even know if we're out of the first half of the inning. Um but I tell you that story that I just told you about financial advisors to tell you, show you the next thing. I've looked around. I've always been looking around trying to find, because I know, I knew that Goldman Sachs had to be in XRP, but I've never really seen it mentioned anywhere. And so I did some searching and this is the only place, and this is actually a negative ripple article that I found. It's one of these standard FUD guys. I don't use the the uh, FUD word and all the, the crypto language much, but this is about, I mean, this, this, I guess, 
this title is about as fud as fud gets. <laughs> so, but this is actually a negative. They were trying to be ne unsuccessfully, as usual, trying to be negative about Ripple. But if you look down here in the article, look at this. I've never seen this in all the time I've been researching this. As we saw in the crypto bull market of 2017, however, many banks such as Citibank, which I've never heard, and Goldman Sachs have been doubling down on cryptocurrency by investing in bank-backed coin in, in a bank-backed coin known as Ripple XRP. This right here is all you need to know. Takeover mania in America. Huge corporations. The early 1980s brought a surge in hostile takeovers. For most investment banks, this was a lucrative new market, too good to pass up. But John Whitehead, a successor to Gus Levy, saw it differently. And it was our observation that the company that had been raided was angry at the company that raided them because the old management all quit and went somewhere else. And it looked to us like unfriendly raids simply didn't work. We decided that Goldman Sachs would not represent uh, acquiring companies that made unfriendly raids. From then on, Goldman was known as Wall Street's white knight, the go-to good guys who defended corporate America. Its new stature brought new clients, new hires, and the beginning of Goldman's notoriously exhaustive interview process. In all of these interviews, they get to know the firm. Edith Cooper is Goldman's global head of human resources. 10, 12, 15 interviews. Interviews. At, at, interviews. Is that typical? Uh, yeah. It is. Uh, if you have people go through an interviewing process, uh, interviewing being done by different personalities, different perspectives, you increase the probability of getting it right. Once Goldman gets it right, each new hire is required to read a document written in the 70s by John Whitehead. I wondered how all these new people that we were hiring, how they could be indoctrinated with the principles of Goldman Sachs, the conduct that we expected from our people. So on a Sunday afternoon and with a yellow pad, I wrote down what turned out to be these principles. The 14 principles would become a roadmap for the company's unmatched success and the success of its employees. When we return, payday at Goldman Sachs. Bob Rubin had a great line that he said to our training classes, your goal is not to get fired that if you can just figure out a way to stay in your seat and do a good job, well, lo and behold, you're going to be rich. That's next, when Goldman Sachs' power and peril continues. Governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. It was the comment heard round the world, one that generated widespread reaction from papers and pundits alike. We appreciate your candor. However, it doesn't help the rest of us, does it? But instead of talking about the comment itself, most outlets immediately sought to shoot the messenger. Alessio Rastani. Forbes called him a psychopath. CNBC suggests it might be a hoax. New York Magazine wonders if it is a hoax or perhaps our worst nightmare. Well, regardless of Rastani's intentions, the bigger question has been largely ignored. Was he wrong about the power of Goldman Sachs? And why was everyone so shocked? After all, right here at RT, in our studios, we've had several guests, bona fide traders, even former Goldman Sachs employees who have said the very same thing. Washington is not the biggest player in this. The global bankers are the biggest players, the global hedge fund managers, uh, and that's where the action, that's who's determining the outcome of this, not, uh, not the players in Washington. They have already ceded control to the global banking industry. Wall Street has been pulling the strings in Washington um, from the get-go. It is the largest um, sector of campaign contributions, and that's to both parties. But for the mainstream media who don't air views like these, Rastani's honesty was unexpected, uh, says Survive um, and Thrive TV's George Heminger. When they asked him these questions on BBC, he just let it all hang out, and the actual truth came across. Rastani also sent shockwaves around the world when he told the BBC that most traders don't really care if and when the economy is fixed. Personally, I've been dreaming of this moment for three years. Uh, I, I, I had a confession, which is, uh, I go to bed every night, I dream of another recession. The BBC interview has now gone viral. If you could see the people around me, jaws have collectively dropped at what you've just said. Perhaps their jaws wouldn't have dropped had they only read Matt Taibbi's July 2009 Rolling Stone article, The Great American Bubble Machine, 
In it, he famously described Goldman Sachs as a, quote, great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Taibbi discussed with us recently how, although people are unaware of it, the big bank has profound power in society. How much are you paying for gas? How much are you paying for electricity? How much are you paying for your credit cards, um, your mortgages? Uh, how much are you paying in taxes? And how much your, of your tax dollars are going to debt service? That is what democracy looks like! Unlike the mainstream media, few here would be shocked by Rastani's comments. We're going to shut down Wall Street! For nearly two weeks, these protesters have been out every day, hoping to bring an end, or at least awareness, to what many call a corrupt system. What do we want? Revolution! When do we want it? Now! And still others have argued for years that the government's actions are dictated by the big banks. The very special interest in, on Wall Street, uh, the insurance industry, uh, these, got, these are the people who are writing the laws that Obama is passing. They are keeping him in power. They're the ones that have financed this campaign, and, and, and the laws are being written for their benefit. Two streets, our streets! As anger builds here, perhaps better questions need to be asked here so that a different message is sent to decision makers here. That the system that has been sustained and protected for decades might need to change. In Washington, Christine Frizzau, RT. Now a second economy story. NewsHour economics correspondent Paul Salmon begins a two-part look at the investment bank Goldman Sachs. Tonight, how it makes money. The company reported a record $13.4 billion profit last year. It's part of Paul's reporting, Making Sense of Financial News. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury Kicking off last month's inaugural hearing of President Obama's Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, CEOs of the four biggest banks, in the hottest of the hot seats, Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. In the end of the day, and I'm going to press you on this, uh, it seems to me that you survived with extraordinary government assistance. Um, we never anticipated the government help. We weren't relying on those mechanisms. And just a year later, venerable Goldman Sachs, beneficiary of bailout largesse, is the most profitable firm in Wall Street history. So how did they do it? Lloyd Blankfein told the Times of London, we're very important. We help companies to grow by helping them to raise capital. And that he was just a banker doing God's work. Now. The interview seemed to play better as comedy than PR. Despite collecting the highest salary on Wall Street at $68 million a year, Blankfein never forgets that he is, quote, a blue-collar guy. <laughs> I believe he is referring to the sapphire choker he wears on casual Fridays. Now, Blankfein took only a $9 million Excellent. bonus for 2009, much less than in recent years, despite record profits. No, As for a defensive why, finance, he elaborated you know, under oath. Is what we do a lot for the economy isn't that visible as an investment bank. We help allocate capital, we raise, we, do, we put companies together, we launch new businesses. So that's how Goldman Sachs is supposedly making money, as a traditional investment bank. Well, not according to Nomi Prince. A former Goldman Sachs trading strategist, now a senior fellow at Demos, a progressive think tank. That classical investment banking function is, is a very small portion of their revenues. I think it's about 10 percent or so. so. So if he's doing God's work, he's only doing it at 10 percent capacity. Most of the rest, says Prince, is so-called proprietary trading for the firm's own account rather than its clients. They're a trading house. They're, 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 you know, they can talk about being an investment bank and um, doing God's work and, and helping you know, raise financing for companies and all in that. But in the scheme of things, they do very little of that. Another longtime Wall Street insider from the other side of the political spectrum agrees. 
though he doesn't disapprove. I think first you have to admit they are very smart, they are very capable, and they have a huge franchise in the global capital markets. David Stockman, that, President Reagan's no budget director, went to Wall Street in the mid-80s. Uh, take their results that just came out in 2009. They had $45 billion of revenue, of which $35 billion was from equity and fixed income trading and commodities and currencies. Now that's 75 percent of their revenue was basically from trading. So when a Republican friend of mine used to be in the Treasury Department says that Goldman Sachs is a hedge fund masquerading as a bank, that's true? Absolutely true. And you could look it up, since Goldman's financial filings are public records. Only a tenth of its revenues came from investment banking last year, more than three-fourths from trading for its own account. But while the firm itself declined any interviews, if it's subordinating the God's work of investment banking to making money on proprietary trading, well, says Jeff Mackey, who's run a hedge fund of his own, so what? Goldman Sachs analyzes their investments as carefully as anyone. Right now, they're saying that proprietary trading is a better business for them. But with all due respect, that is not God's work. Listen, I'm not saying that they're necessarily doing my God's work, but as far as they're concerned, they're doing financial God's work. You can argue whether or not they should be doing this, but what they really should be doing is making money for the shareholders. That's their job. It's not theirs to judge who or why or how they're going about it. They need to make bucks for shareholders. But consider how they're making those bucks, says Nomi Prince. On inside knowledge that comes in, as when she was there, with every trade a client asks Goldman to make. And just by evidence from the profits that they make and where they make them, what divisions they make them in, they're not sitting on that knowledge. Um, they have to be, they are trading on that knowledge. So they know somebody's going to buy a commodity or a currency, so they either buy that commodity or currency first or a commodity and currency very much like it. Any information that you get, um, particularly if it's going to move the markets a lot, is, is, is going to filter in the, to the trading positions you take. But isn't this front running, trading ahead of your clients to profit from the price changes that will come from the client's trades, but for your own firm's benefit? And isn't that, strictly speaking, illegal? The long and ancient secret of Wall Street is they've always been front running their clients. In other words, when you're in the customer trading business and then you're in the proprietary business, which trade are you making first? I don't know. And if it's in milliseconds, how's anybody going to figure it out? So uh, I, I don't know if uh, you ought to get all exercised on that or not. But the fact that they make all this money in proprietary trading is clearly part and parcel of being a massive player dealer in uh, the markets uh, for both customer trades and house trades. So Goldman might insist that technically it isn't front running or that the charge could never be proved. So let's move to another. How about the extravagantly profitable bets for its own account that Goldmine Sachs, as some call it, placed with insurer AIG? against the very products, mortgage-backed securities, that the firm was trading to customers. McClatchy reporter Greg Gordon was the first to uncover the practice. In 2006, Goldman began in different ways to make bets that the housing market would turn south. When you're selling $40 billion in securities, U.S. registered securities to investors here and abroad in 2006 and 2007, and at the same time you're secretly betting that these securities are going to go south, they're going to lose value, well that raises a big question. Lloyd Blankfein's response? What we do is risk management. Because we had this risk, because we were accumulating positions, which by the way we acquire from clients who want to sell them to us, we have to go out ourselves and, and provide and source the other side of the transactions so that we can manage our risk. These are all exercises in risk management. Well, I, I'm just going to be blunt with you. It sounds to me a little bit like selling a car with faulty brakes and then buying an insurance policy on the buyer of those cars. Pension funds who have the life savings of police officers, These teachers. are the professional investors who want this exposure professional, sophisticated investors who should have known what they were getting into with mortgage-backed securities. A theme Blankfein hit again and again. 
a sophisticated investor that creates the exposure that these professional investors are seeking. Again, the most sophisticated investors who sought that exposure. And look, says investment advisor Jeff Mackey, even if Goldman's people are more sophisticated than their clients, Blankfein's still right. In caveat emptor, Goldman Sachs didn't get to become Goldman Sachs because they're bad traders. Of course they know more than the other guys. They're packaging the goods. It's their book. They know more about it than anyone. And if they're selling it, well, you probably don't want to be a buyer. I want to buy things from people who I know more than, not people who are creating these instruments for me to buy. But pension funds don't bring in the math whizzes, the quants, the people that Goldman Sachs has. They're no match for Goldman Sachs' salespeople or traders. Generally speaking, they aren't. So what is your pension fund doing involved in these securities? That's Even the if you think Mackey and Blankfein provide a reasoned defense, however, one huge last question remains. Has the firm been making record profits with your and my money? We'll look at that next time. Um, our next guest used to manage over $7 billion at Goldman Sachs before leaving to start a passive crypto index fund. Christopher Matta is a co-founder of Crescent Crypto Asset Management. He joins us for his Fast Money debut. Chris, welcome to the show. Great Thanks to have you with us. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Um, you left when? Last year? Last fall. Last fall. So it was yep. just before the huge run-up. Yeah, exactly. So at the time, uh, the space was really starting to grow. Uh, it went from being uh, a personal hobby to being a full-time focus. Um, and at the time, there weren't really any passive players in the space. There were a handful of active managers charging 2 and 20 or 3 and 30, very high fees. And we had demand just in our own networks being known as the crypto guys. Um, at Goldman. At, yeah. at Goldman. We had demand from colleagues, friends, uh, and other people in our network for a really complexity-free product that they wanted to get diversified exposure to the space. So it was kind of the perfect timing. A little bit. I wanted to do a video. I think this is going to be the first of many articles that you're going to be reading from now till the end of the year, 2018. When I read it, I'm like, I have got to do a video before I pick up the kids at school. Awesome sauce. So there's a newly appointed Goldman Sachs vice president, newly appointed, okay? He hasn't been there for five years, 10 years, 15. Newly appointed Goldman Sachs vice president is leaving for the cryptocurrency space. Now I'm thinking Goldman Sachs, you're making, you're making six figures easy, easy, right? So person's name is Chris Mata, Chris, C-H-R-I-S, Mata, M-A-T-T-A, is quitting I just got to read it because I'm going to I'm going to mess it up. Wall Street is turning over to cryptocurrency. And this is seen with former Goldman Sachs banker Chris Mata quitting the famous financial companies a few days after earning the position of vice president. Who in their right minds would do that? He did it all for cryptocurrency. Now stop right there. You may be a factory worker, you may be a blue collar guy, I'm just a regular guy, and you say, why would someone quit after a few days of being promoted to a vice president position at Goldman Sachs? Answer, very simple. He saw a better opportunity and left that to go do that. Okay? He was managing over seven billion B, B I L L I O N, for the philanthropy fund and trust company. There was actually him and two other people that quit. And they decided to create their own cryptocurrency focused investment vehicle. Their crypto related company is called Crescent Crypto Asset Management, CCAM, I guess. So 
He thinks cryptos is a better bet than being a vice president and all its perks at Goldman Sachs. I'm going to put a link to this article below, but I guarantee you, you're going to have well-connected people in the banking industry leaving their jobs, whether they've been in that position a day, a month, a year, and flocking into the crypto space. Let me know what you think, and let me know if Chris did a good idea. I think he did. See you later. Bye-bye. Is there diversified exposure to the space since so many of them are correlated? Yeah, so there's there's various levels of correlation between these coins, but holding a basket of, of 20 versus just holding Bitcoin, you're going to get better absolute and risk adjusted returns in a, because of that diversification benefit that you get. So even though it's it, each coin may be incremental, it's still better than holding just something like Bitcoin. Your drawdowns will be less, less volatility. Um, withholding a diversified basket. How important was the SEC and what they decided today when it comes to uh, Ether, when it comes to utility tokens, to what you do? And when you take a look at the 10% pop in Ether or the 6% pop in Bitcoin on the news, do you think, I would think that the cryptos would be up even more based on that? Yeah, I think people generally had a sense of what the feeling was with Ethereum. I think there was some still murkiness around that. Um, so I, I think we've been in kind of this regulatory, this regulatory uncertainty for six months now. And this is just one piece of a broader picture, right? There's still the custodian question. There's still uh, questions around exchange traded products, which really need to be answered before uh, more institutions feel more comfortable and get into the space in an, in an easier way. And exchange traded products are something that we're really focused on as, as a big catalyst in the space over the next year or two. Hey, Chris, so you have this basket of 20 currencies. How do you decide what to put in that basket? Is it simply just market cap weighted? Yeah. And over the, do you see that changing over time? Yeah, we wanted to create something that was future proof. So there is a market cap weight, but it's a 90 day average to really smooth the volatility. You see some of these coins explode in value and jump into the top 20. They really need to sustain that value to be to prove themselves, I guess, as a, as a real true investment. So it needs to meet that threshold to stay in the portfolio. We also have controls around liquidity measures. It has to meet certain thresholds and be available on multiple exchanges that are available here in the United States. And actually, custody is, is a big piece for us. We, we won't hold a coin that you can't hold in cold storage. So, uh, you know, funds, we want to make sure that, that people are able to store these in the safest way. As you constantly hear about these exchange hacks, uh, we don't want our clients or, or the index to really be taking that risk. So you started uh, your fund in the fall, and you saw the huge run-up, and times are great. Everybody wanted in, and then you saw the big decline. Have you yeah. seen people want out? And how has that been managing investors? I mean, everybody wanted to start a crypto fund, and now it's like, who wants to start a crypto fund? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's definitely been, thankfully, we do a lot of education up front, I think is a big piece. We explain to people this is a really long-term investment. It's, we're looking at a two- to five-year-plus time horizon. And I don't think the bull thesis has changed at all. You know, you saw a lot of volatility, but uh, there was a bit of a mania at the end of last year, and now the regulators have started to step in. But I think long term, their, their tune has been pretty bullish. Uh, so our clients thankfully understand that. We told them when they were coming in, you know, this could be down 50% tomorrow. It could be up 300% next week. You have to hold this for, for a longer term. And, and people that understand that allocate appropriately in their overall portfolio to this asset class, understand that and, and will ultimately do well. The culture of Wall Street has always been a source of popular fascination, in part due to its stratospheric pay, a subject of both envy and revulsion. At Goldman Sachs, CEO Lloyd Blankfein took home more than $67 million in total compensation in 2007. In 2009, a year after receiving a $10 billion taxpayer bailout, Goldman paid out a staggering $16 billion to its workforce, almost half a million dollars on average for each of its 32,000 employees. Anthony Scaramucci, a Goldman vice president during the 90s, remembers the advice of then CEO Robert Rubin. Bob Rubin had a great line that he said to our training classes, your goal is not to get fired. 
This is such a great firm that if you can just figure out a way to stay in your seat and do a good job, well, lo and behold, you're going to be rich. By the time Scaramucci left the firm, he was pulling down $1.5 million a year. But the money didn't come easily. There were relentless hours and high expectations. Now a CNBC contributor and running his own asset management firm, Scaramucci remembers the lengths the bank went to to instill the Goldman work ethic. We arrive at the, at the meeting at 5 p.m. It's the Friday before the Memorial Day three-day weekend. And guess what? We are sitting there waiting. A couple guys left. Okay, when the guy showed up at 10 o'clock, five hours late, he passed around an attendance sheet. And he said, you know, the lesson today is about waiting for people that are more important than you. And he said, someday there'll be a billionaire you need to get to. He's going to make you wait in his lobby. Okay, you need to be conditioned for that. And then he got up and he left. And what happened to those new hires who left early? Scaramucci says they were promptly fired. Stories like that only reinforced Goldman's mystique as a tightly knit culture of extraordinarily driven professionals with a guarded approach to outsiders. Day one training, going back to day one, don't talk to the press. That was the number one thing they said to people. A reluctance to open up is still a cornerstone of the Goldman culture, as we discovered in our own dealings with the firm. Goldman Sachs officials agreed to cooperate with us for this report. But the access we were given to the firm turned out to be very limited. Interviews with rank and file employees were off limits, as were most locations inside their building. We weren't allowed to bring our cameras to the firm's trading floor or any public spaces. We weren't even allowed to show you the lobby. We did reach out to dozens of former Goldman employees. Most wouldn't talk to us, and the few who agreed to did so only after first checking with headquarters. Striking evidence of an enduring loyalty built upon Goldman's emphasis on teamwork. Very famous line at Goldman, here's the difference between us and the other firms. We've got six guns, we're all cowboys. We're going to point our guns outside, we're going to shoot outside. Inside these other firms, they got one gun pointed on each other. What made us different was our ability to get along with each other and act collegial. That collegiality stems from a time when Goldman was a tightly knit group of partners whose money and efforts were pooled for their common profit. By the late 1990s, every other major investment bank had chosen to raise billions through a public offering of stock. In 1999, to stay in the game, Goldman followed suit. A big debut expected tomorrow for the Goldman Sachs initial public offering. It was a time of extraordinary change for the bank and its culture. Like the rest of Wall Street, Goldman was also moving away from classic investment banking, financing mergers and advising clients towards trading, both for clients and for itself, in everything from oil to subprime mortgages. Financial historian Neil Ferguson says that increasing appetite for trading had profound implications. The big shift has really been from advising corporations and handling their financing to running what increasingly resembled giant hedge funds. You don't really have clients anymore. You just have people that you trade with. Never mind the relationships. They need us. We need them. It's business. Um, so we'll get into that here in a second. Uh, your Fernando will explain right, all okay. of that. So here's what I, here's what I want to go to now. Okay. The, the question that I had for you um, the other day was why are you calling this the great crypto conspiracy? Okay. And when you explained it to me, yeah. it, it's really, people should go to jail, but it's not illegal. No. Um, and this is really horrible. And it's why we all feel so freaked out, but they are feasting on our savings. Um, and it's, it's a, an enormous robbery. Um, quite honestly, it's a, I think. it's a huge transfer of wealth that's happening right now. The last time I saw something like this was back during 1994 to 1995. In the, in the early uh, to mid-90s, individuals were making just enormous amounts of money buying companies like Dell, AOL, Microsoft, uh, Netscape, and some of these smaller internet stocks. And the institutions had completely missed that bull market. And so they were scoffing at these so-called lemmings. And so during 1994 to 1995, we had a bit of a bear market. 
And so, again, institutions were out saying that, oh, anybody buying Internet stocks, you're idiotic. And so you had a lot of people selling their AOL, selling their Microsoft, selling their Dell shares. Guess who was buying? It was the institutions. If you look at a chart of institutional allocation to uh, venture capital Internet deals, it doubled between 1994 to 1995, which was exactly when institutions were saying, oh, this is just a market for idiots. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be buying this stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, they literally stole all this wealth that should have been in the hands of individuals that owned Dell, Microsoft, and AOL. And then from 1995 to 2000, of course, you know, we saw $5 trillion come into the market in the biggest bull market we've ever seen. So this blueprint of creating fear in order to get cheap prices is, is nothing new. So and you we, know, hang on just a second, yeah, before you go on, yeah. this one is really important to me because right. the housing crisis, those banks, they bought up all of those houses. They right. were the ones who caused the problem. Right. Then they were talking everything down, down. and saying, "I'm just taking the gr I'm taking the the junk off the table." Yeah. That's not junk now. It's not junk. It's not, when it when it's dropped forty to sixty percent, it's not junk. So this happened between 2011 2012. Blackstone Group buys fifty thousand homes, but during this period of time, the regular individual couldn't get a mortgage. Right, it was virtually impossible to get right. a mortgage during this time, exactly when institutions were buying. And then the dot-com crash in 03. If you can go back and look at old CNBC clips during 03, yeah. even as the market was starting to come up, oh, don't buy tech stocks. No, they're evil. Don't buy tech stocks. Don't buy tech stocks. But institutions, if you looked at the 10Ks, the Qs, and all of the filings, the quarterly filings, they were all loading up this on is, tech. This is how the rich get richer. Yes. They know they're connected. A lot of times they're coordinating yes. uh, without the insider trading. This right. is not illegal to do. No. Um, manipulating the news cycle, if yes. you're smart about it, is, is right. they can get away with it. Nobody's ever been arrested for anything like so this. So now with crypto, yes, I know personally, I know people that would have gotten in or stayed in right. if these people weren't saying what they're saying. Right. And so this, this has really been extremely egregious. So on September 12th, Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin is a fraud. He says he'll fire any one of his traders buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin drops 24%. When Jamie Dimon speaks, people listen. People listen. So that weekend, we found out that the largest buyer... Of a, of a Bitcoin fund that's in Europe that buys physical Bitcoin, right? The largest buyer was Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. And that's not illegal. He says it's a fraud. It says he'd fire anyone that buys it. Yes. And at the same time, his company is buying his it. His company is buying it. So, ir it's just, I mean, so unethical. Right. Okay, George Soros. George Soros, in Eight January 24th, <laughs> price was already down calls Bitcoin a bubble, says Bitcoin is the worst, you know, the worst investment in the world. Don't buy Bitcoin. Don't buy Bitcoin. Basically throws uh, gasoline on the fire yeah. at this point. And then what do we find out? So he says bubble here. It drops 44%. Right. And then here in April, two months later, guess what we find out? Yeah. His $26 billion family office has approval to buy cryptocurrency. Right. And you only, we only knew about it publicly Right. Here. Here. And yes. this is the kind of thing that George George Soros is famous for this, talking yeah. the sterling down. Yeah. And what did he do? He stole the pensions of all the little people. Yeah, made a billion. Yeah. Okay. So then here now, Goldman Sachs, this again, February seventh, most cryptocurrencies will crash to zero. Now I remember when they said this in February, and I had through my network, I knew that Goldman Sachs was setting up a crypto trading desk. Absolutely knew they were setting up a crypto trading desk. And I then, remember you telling me that. Right. And then, uh, of course, they were denying it. No, yeah, we're not. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. we're not. No, we're not. Yeah. Price falls down 27%. And then what do we find out? We find out here, uh, they say BTC zero. And then we find out just before May, new trading desk. Not only that, they put $400 million to buy a cryptocurrency trading platform. Okay. So February 7th, it's all going to zero. 
May, oh, we're gonna, we just spent 400 million just on a, on a flyer. And they're not the only ones? No, no. Um, so you have a lot of institutions that are coming. You had Christine Lagarde from the IMF yeah. come out. And this was, what's funny about this, Glenn, is it was all around the same time. It yeah. was almost like the, I can't prove collusion. But, you know, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. And, and you know what? It's probably a duck. The people, they all hang out together. They all think alike. It doesn't right. have to be calling each other. Yeah. They just, they know this game. Yes. So IMF, Christine Lagarde says in the first part of the year, says all central banks should band together against right. cryptocurrency. Right. Have you ever heard her say all, all banks should band together against illegal arms? No. Or illegal drugs? No. Or human trafficking? No. No. But this nascent asset class, we must all join arms and against. This, what this did was play into people's heads that these guys are never going to let Bitcoin survive. survive. Right. And so people thought, they this is over. Selling. Yeah. So let me show you. I'm, can we show a chart of the five crashes? This is from, I think... Last year, right? Last year. Yeah. Okay. Do we have, we have that chart of the, the five crashes of, of Bitcoin? Right. It was 30%. Right. It was, I think four of them were 30%, and right. one was 40%. And, uh, and this is, here it is. Um, sh sh explain this chart. And those right. are Amazon crashes. Here okay, so these are Amazon. Do you have, Do we have Bitcoin? Yeah, we need the Bitcoin chart. We are All right, so they'll, good. they'll come they'll up later. Okay. Yeah. So what I want to talk about now is... One of the key lessons I learned from being involved in the market so long is rather than uh, listening to what people are saying, look at what they are doing. Correct. So this is what we should look at, and this is what I want people to focus on now. Billionaire hedge fund manager Stephen Cohen, who's worth between 12 to $14 billion, by far the smartest hedge fund manager in the world, I would say of the last century, is buying Bitcoin. $6,800 buying Bitcoin. Mark Lazary, Avenue Capital Group, worth about $1.7 billion, has put 1% of his net worth into Bitcoin at around this price, $7,500. Andresine Horowitz. Mark Andreessen. That's right, Mark Andreessen. An early investor in Airbnb, Skype, Facebook, just launched yeah, a 300... Coinbase, yeah, and Coinbase. Just launched a $300 million fund. Wellington Capital, they have a trillion dollars in assets, are starting to get involved in Bitcoin futures. Susquehanna, the 12th largest trading firm by volume, they now have their own Bitcoin custody department, their own trading department, and they're trading Bitcoin and Ethereum. Goldman Sachs, this new CEO, David Solomon, the most pro-Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency guy on Wall Street. The most pro- Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs. He's the new CEO. He's coming yeah. into power shortly. BlackRock, this announcement just came out. The world's biggest asset manager. Now, last year, Larry Fink says, oh, you know what cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is good for? Yeah. Money laundering and yeah. drug dealers. Right. Right. So, again, you, if you look at what he's saying, you're going to sell your Bitcoin, right? Yeah. You're going to say, oh, this is, this is yeah. all BS. But guess what is happening now? They're going to launch an ETF. They're looking at an exchange-traded fund. Right that will allow you, uh, allow anybody with a brokerage firm to make it as easy as hitting a buy button to go out and buy Bitcoin. So you've got to look at this preponderance of evidence, right? All these people are already wealthy. All these people care about their reputation. If Bitcoin is such a trashy asset, why are all these people getting involved? This is kind of, it's really interesting because this is kind of like uh, in a, a much more positive way on this side, than what these people are doing. It's kind of like with Donald Trump. You don't listen to what he says, because he'll say some stuff that's like, what? Watch what he does. Right. Because what he's doing is making sense, if you're a conservative, is making sense, right. and it's, it's moving orderly. But what he says sometimes is almost misdirection. It is Goldman's aggressive trading culture that has recently come under close scrutiny amid accusations of conflicts of interest, claims that it chose one client over another. In 2010, the bank got into deep trouble over an exotic deal with an exotic name, Abacus. Goldman marketed the Abacus deal without telling investors that the securities they were buying were chosen in part by a client who believed those securities would fail. When they did crumble, that client, 
hedge fund manager John Paulson netted a billion dollars. Robert Kuzami runs enforcement for the Securities and Exchange Commission. The investors were not told that somebody with an opposite economic interest was involved in selecting the portfolio. The SEC charged Goldman with fraud for not revealing Paulson's role. At the time, Goldman called the charges completely unfounded, and CEO Lloyd Blankfein vowed to fight. Do you continue to maintain, as you did vociferously, uh, when the charges first were made, that you did nothing wrong, that Goldman Sachs had done nothing wrong? Yes, we maintain our belief that on the facts and on the law, uh, we think we were right and acted appropriately. But in the end, while it didn't admit to committing fraud, it did say it had made a mistake and paid an historic penalty. $550 $550 million. The largest penalty assessed against a Wall Street firm or an investment bank in the history of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The Abacus deal is one example of apparent conflicts of interest within the bank. Conflicts Goldman readily concedes. Listen to this conference call between Blank Fine and the firm's clients in the spring of 2010. You know, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that there are conflicts in this business and the potential for conflicts. And it's not the conflicts, it's how you manage the conflicts that, that, that shows your quality and your, and your character. I think we have been pretty good at it, although there are cases where maybe our judgment is a little bit off, but that's certainly our motivation. When both traditional investment banking and trading take place in the same firm, a bank can not only pick one client over another, according to Neil Ferguson, it can also use its own money to bet against its clients. I don't think once you put everything together under one roof, you can avoid there being major conflicts uh, of interest. There is a massive risk uh, of simply trading against the clients. It would seem to me the modern day investment bank is fraught with conflicts of interest throughout its operations. There are conflicts everywhere. My uh, understanding is that uh, the ethos at Goldman Sachs, the, the watchword, is to embrace these conflicts of interest, uh, uh, to love them. In the end, if conflicts of interest are the friend uh, of the investment banker, uh, you have to wonder who's on the losing side uh, of that particular trade. But Steve Scher, who heads the firm's financing group, defends Goldman's embattled culture. He says the firm holds true to its core principles. The client is still Number one, we're not facing off and engaging with our clients to solve their problems with an eye toward where will the firm make its money. The firm does well, but the firm will only do well and individuals at the firm will only do well as and to the extent that we serve our clients appropriately. You know, I've spoken to many clients of Goldman Sachs and and I must tell you, uh, while their regard for the firm is extraordinarily high, they say, you know, I do deal with Goldman Sachs because they have very good people and I need to deal with Goldman. But I don't necessarily feel that Goldman has my best interests at heart. Goldman is looking out for Goldman. Well, I would take issue with the conclusion you drew about Goldman looking out for Goldman. I think at the end of the day, we will only do well to the extent that we do well by our clients. Uh, That's where it begins and that's where it ends. While Goldman Sachs says its clients have stuck by the firm, the court of public opinion has not. When we return, an American city bruised and battered. It was the complicity of firms like Goldman Sachs that not only ruined neighborhoods that were already struggling in Cleveland, but really wrecked our financial system and did incalculable harm. That's next, when Goldman Sachs Power and Peril continues. Welcome to Cleveland. Hundreds of miles from Wall Street, but at the dead center of the home mortgage crisis that gripped the U.S. during the Great Recession. What you see is a mortgage that's gone bad, a house that got abandoned, and all that's left is the wrecking ball. Tony Brancatelli has seen whole parts of his city fall to ruin. He's a city councilman for Cleveland's Slavic Village, a blighted neighborhood where risky mortgage practices flourished. 
When I say uh, the name Goldman Sachs to you, it, it scares you the hell out of me. These investment groups have created this. These houses got traded like commodities, like gas and or oranges. And Councilman Brancatelli believes Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street banks are guilty of fueling reckless lending here. That lending created a real estate bubble whose implosion leveled whole tracks of this struggling blue collar neighborhood. We've already demolished about 10,000 properties. That's citywide. You said 500, though. In this neighborhood. In your, in this just neighborhood. in this neighborhood. Who do you blame for all of this? Oh, I look directly at Wall Street. When it came to Wall Street, Goldman Sachs was neither the biggest nor the smallest in providing money to lenders, much of which went to subprime borrowers. Councilman, I think Goldman Sachs would say a few things in their defense. We were providing money to the mortgage lenders here on the ground so that people could afford to buy homes. You know, that's an argument that a drug dealer uses when he goes to jail. I was only providing what people were asking for. They were peddling a bad drug, and it was called bad mortgages. And they continued to peddle those bad mortgages. They continued to provide that drug for people who could not afford to pay those mortgages. This is what we're left with. We went with Brancatelli to an abandoned house that has a direct connection to Goldman Sachs. Goldman bought the mortgage on this home and others around the country from lenders who made the loans. Like other banks, Goldman pooled thousands of these mortgages and sold shares in that pool. The result? An investment called a mortgage-backed security that offered its buyers a steady stream of cash that flowed from homeowners' monthly mortgage payments. The market for mortgage-backed securities exploded. But then the value of homes stopped rising. And borrowers who couldn't refinance or sell their way out of mortgages they couldn't afford were faced with foreclosure. These were $20,000, $30,000 houses, which briefly became $100,000 houses. Right, and right, now right. we're $6,000 yeah, houses. No, less than that. I mean, the average sale price in this neighborhood is around $5,000. Make no mistake about it. This crisis has put this uh, city and this region and this country in many respects flat on its back. County Treasurer Jim Rakakis says there are plenty of people to blame, including homeowners who took on mortgages they couldn't afford. But he says it's Wall Street that bears the largest responsibility for Cleveland's plight. None of this could have happened until people, the size and the power and the strength of Goldman really entered the fray. But Goldman Sachs would say we were not the biggest offender if we even were an offender. We ultimately were doing what Wall Street's supposed to be doing. We allocated capital where we thought it would be used well. We packaged up the securities, we sold those securities, we continued that capital being able to flow into these communities. What's the problem? They may argue they weren't the worst, but they were certainly very much part of this problem. They knew these companies were putting bad product out on the street. They were too smart not to know that. But the profits were also too large to ignore. We wanted to ask Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein about that charge and other claims made against the firm. But we didn't have the chance. When the time came for a long-promised sit-down interview with him for this documentary, Goldman Sachs reneged. In a written response, Goldman officials told us they did not fuel reckless mortgage lending, insisting we did extensive due diligence on the loans we bought. We did not purchase loans where we knew the borrowers were unable or unlikely to pay. Regardless, the housing bubble kept growing. But just in case it burst, Goldman was prepared. It protected itself by betting against the very mortgage-backed securities that it created and sold to investors in the first place. Goldman had protected itself with an exotic Wall Street invention, similar to an insurance policy, that enabled it to bet that people here in Cleveland and elsewhere wouldn't pay their mortgages back. It was a complex financial creation with a name only a banker could love, a synthetic collateralized debt obligation, or synthetic CDO. If the value of the mortgage is held up, Goldman, like any holder of an insurance policy, would continue to make a steady stream of relatively small payments. But if the mortgage market did collapse, Goldman stood to reap a huge reward. There's something wrong with the system that allows a firm to package and sell mortgages to their investors that they know are iffy and collecting fees on the front end for packaging these mortgages and then betting against it on the other end. That is wrong, and they did it. One of those synthetic CDOs that Goldman offered was a deal called Hudson Mezzanine, 
that got the attention of Senator Carl Levin. The $2 billion Hudson synthetic CDO, a Goldman salesperson described it as junk, not to the buyer, of course, but inside. The CDO imploded within two years. Your clients lost. Goldman profited. Here's how Goldman used its Hudson deal to bet against the mortgages it had sold as investments just months earlier. It started with homes like this at 785 Wayside Road in Cleveland. In 2006, Goldman bought the mortgage on this house, pooled it with others, and created a mortgage-backed security that it offered to customers. This empty lot on Wayside is where that home once stood. It turns out Goldman made two deals that included the mortgage for this home in the same year, the mortgage-backed security and the Hudson Synthetic CDO. In the first, Goldman offered an investment to customers who expected the mortgages would be paid back. In Hudson, Goldman was wagering its own money that the mortgages would not be paid back. That raises the question, was the bank selling investments it assumed would go bad? Goldman insists it was not. Quote, we did not choose securities with the belief they would lose value. If investors did not like the underlying securities, they could have chosen not to invest. Craig Broderick heads risk management for Goldman Sachs. The larger takeaway for so many people seems to be that Goldman Sachs knew better than anybody else and gamed the system uh, and knew that the mortgage market was about to collapse and therefore did something that no other firm did. It might uh, enhance my profile as a risk manager if I were able to sit here and say we had great uh, uh, insight into how the market was going to move. Goldman officials say the bank lost money investing in residential mortgages. Further proof, they say, that they didn't expect the housing market to collapse. We nearly knew that the market appeared to have more risk inherent in it than we had understood previously. And therefore, the appropriate action was to, uh, was to reduce risk. To reduce its risk, Goldman turned to those Wall Street concoctions, synthetic CDOs. The reason they're called synthetic is because no mortgages are actually bought or sold. A synthetic CDO is simply a wager, a bet on whether mortgages will be paid back. That means Goldman and other banks could create bets on the same mortgages again and again. Along the way, the bad debt just kept multiplying. I want to clear path out the door, please. Clear the door. Whether Goldman gained the system or not, the widespread belief that it did has led many to question its integrity. Head of Human Resources Edith Cooper defends the bank as committed to its core principles. We're very focused on um, not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of that. We pay attention to honesty. Somebody listening to this conversation who's unaffiliated and doesn't know much about Goldman Sachs except what they read in the newspaper would be like, what is this lady talking about? This is Goldman Sachs. They are not honest. They are not doing the right thing. They're betting against the American dream. I feel very uh, strongly about the purpose uh, that Goldman Sachs serves uh, and the principal nature of what we do. Um, I also feel very strongly that we aren't perfect. We need to communicate more directly about what we do. We know that we are an organization that's based on all of the things that are key to our business principles, hon honesty, integrity, uh, entrepreneurialism, because if we weren't, we would not have support from our clients. But we don't take any of that for granted. We recognize that we have to earn that every day, and we have a lot of work to do to continue to have that type of loyalty. Goldman may also have a lot of work to do to revive the trust of another critical constituency, government. Has the name Goldman Sachs become toxic in Washington, D.C.? It is right now. Coming up, a story of public service, money, influence, and high office. When Goldman Sachs, Power and Peril continues. I don't think there's any other private institution in the United States that's had the impact on domestic policy that Goldman Sachs has had. They're huge. They're the big bad Leroy Brown of financial influence in Washington, D.C. 
When it comes to visibility and influence, Goldman Sachs is as noticeable on Pennsylvania Avenue as it is on Wall Street. And its access to Washington power was never more apparent than on July 10, 2006, the swearing in of Goldman CEO Henry Paulson as Secretary of the Treasury. Today he's showing his character and patriotism by leaving his career to serve our country. It was a gathering of the Goldman clan as another member reached the highest levels of government service. There was Paulson's successor at Goldman, Lloyd Blankfein, former chairman and one-time Bush advisor Stephen Friedman, and White House Chief of Staff Josh Bolton, also a Goldman alum. It was a proud and happy occasion for Goldman Sachs. But just two years later, the smiles would be gone, and Hank Paulson would be in the fight of his life. Nervous investors want to know what's next. J.P. Morgan Chase is buying Bear Stearns at a rock-bottom price. The subprime crisis has been its undoing. Foreclosures up a staggering 87%. Fannie and Freddie under new management, the federal government. The financial crisis of 2008. Insurance giant AIG on life support tonight. Lehman Brothers filing for bankruptcy. Merrill Lynch sold to Bank of America. Never thought it would come to this. The system itself on the verge of collapse. A stunning day on the stock market. Stocks fell off a cliff. People are depressed and scared. The president announces an unprecedented bailout plan to save the nation's banks. The federal government would put up to 700 billion taxpayer dollars on the line. This is an urgent matter and we need to move very quickly. At Treasury, Hank Paulson has surrounded himself with a posse of Goldman Sachs alumni. Robert Steele, Neil Kashkari, Kendrick Wilson, Ed Forrest, Dan Jester, and Steve Shaffron. Their overwhelming numbers earn them a nickname from the Washington Wags, Government Sachs. I think almost anybody else would have said, okay, I'll bring one or two in, but if I'm going to bring in an army, it's going to look bad. University of Maryland law professor Michael Greenberger is a former director at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The bailout was going to take great imagination and diversity of views, and bringing people who come from the same mindset was a terrible mistake. But they are amongst the best and the brightest. They have a long history of serving in government. And to Paulson's defense, who else are you going to go to when you're trying to figure things out? I think that question, with all respect to you, is revealing of a very narrow, shallow view of the financial world. There are many people in the United States who are very familiar with financial markets who happen not to work at Wall Street. Former Goldman Chairman John Corzine, who went on to serve in the U.S. Senate and as governor of New Jersey, says Paulson should get the benefit of the doubt. When you have to make the toughest decisions in your life, it's nice to have people around that you trust. Should Paulson have been more aware of public perception when he hired all those guys from Goldman? I, I think in 2020 hindsight, a lot of things are um, easier to recognize. But concern over the extent of Goldman's influence deepened after insurance company AIG survived the crisis with a taxpayer bailout that eventually reached $183 billion. That allowed AIG to repay a $13 billion debt to Goldman, one of many banks that were paid out in full on the money owed them by AIG. That whole episode is very, very questionable. Why let Lehman fail one day and then rescue AIG the other day? Was it because Goldman needed the $13 billion that AIG was a counterparty for? A lot of people believe it was the influence and the concern uh, for Goldman. Henry Paulson wouldn't speak to us for this report, but a spokesman for Goldman Sachs says the firm exerted no influence in the AIG bailout and Paulson defended himself before Congress in 2009. I left Goldman Sachs. I sold my shares in Goldman Sachs. Uh, I operated very consistently within the ethic guidelines I had as Secretary of the Treasury. Old Goldman hands like former Chairman John Whitehead, who himself left for the number two job in Ronald Reagan's State Department, bristle at suggestions of a Goldman conspiracy. It's very discouraging to me that to have people volunteer for public service, that it's seen by some to be a sort of an insidious desire to take over control of Washington, which is ridiculous. Before joining our administration, 
Bob built a brilliant career at Goldman Sachs and Company. Where... Former Goldman Chair Robert Rubin's tenure as economic advisor and then Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration came during a time of unprecedented growth. The national motto might be, let the good times roll. It's a day for the record books on Wall Street. 819 points in just two days. Once hailed as an economic savior, Rubin has come under fire over his support for financial deregulation that some say favored Wall Street and his former colleagues at Goldman. Now, it's time to reform Glass-Steagall. Critics say the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act encouraged some banks to pursue more profitable and riskier lines of business. They also fault Rubin for not pushing more aggressively for regulation of complex financial instruments that helped trigger the 2008 financial crisis. Mr. Rubin, looking at the big... That issue was put to him by a government commission investigating the crisis. You've said in the past that there was no political will <laughs> to regulate over-the-counter derivatives. Was the lack of political will related to pressure by the financial services industry? I think there were very strongly held views in the financial services industry in opposition to regulation, and I think that they were not surmountable at that point. In Washington, political will, or lack thereof, is more often than not directly tied to money. And when it comes to Goldman Sachs, there's always plenty of that to go around. Their PAC and their executives have spent $32 million in campaign contributions uh, in the past 20 years. Nick Nyhart runs Public Campaign, a campaign finance reform group. The financial sector as a whole is the most powerful giving sector, but they're the top giver within the financial sector uh, to candidates and, and incumbents in Congress. But in election year 2010, candidates were less eager to take Goldman's money. Has the name Goldman Sachs become toxic in Washington, D.C.? It is right now. Any association with Goldman Sachs was seen as such a liability that almost two dozen candidates, including Arkansas Senator Blanche Lincoln, refused Goldman campaign contributions or donated them to charity. We never had a fundraiser with Goldman. We said we wouldn't raise any more money from them. We wouldn't take any more money from them. Goldman Sachs, you're the worst. Time to put the people first. Are we going to see Goldman lose clout in Washington, D.C. over an extended period of time? If I had to bet, the answer to that is yes, they're going to lose clout. Who got the money, money, they got the money, money. I think they've lost their brand. Their brand was phenomenal. I think their brand is now a liability rather than an asset. Money, money, we got the bill. To counter months of negative publicity, Goldman went on the offensive, unveiling a national ad campaign to bolster its image. But the question remains, does it really matter what the public thinks? Goldman Sachs is about one thing, money! As the digital asset investor, um, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, something I saw in the news today about, uh, I saw an article, probably the best article I saw today was about Circle, which is the um, which is the blockchain company that was started uh, that was funded by Goldman Sachs, and it got me to thinking about some things about Goldman Sachs that I've been meaning to talk to you about, um, and so I was going to go over the, those today. For those of you, um, I've told you before that I was a financial advisor at one of the top three um, brokerage firms on uh, Wall Street. It was not Goldman Sachs. Um, but it was pretty close to Goldman Sachs. So anyway, um, I, Goldman Sachs, just to, for those of you that don't know, as Wall Street goes, Goldman Sachs is pretty much the king of the hill with the golden gates in front of it. Goldman Sachs, is, there's more money at Goldman Sachs, uh, under man, more assets under management than anywhere on Wall Street. Goldman Sachs pretty much runs our country if you didn't already know that goldman sachs has ties to uh president i mean anything you can th anybody you can name federal reserve chairman presidents secretary of the treasury you name it a lot of them worked at goldman sachs or left goldman sachs to go work in those government positions or left the government positions and went to goldman sachs it's all tied in the reason i mentioned this is because Goldman Sachs runs the monetary world and thus the political world as well. 
And so this year, uh, Lloyd Blankfein has been the CEO of Goldman Sachs. He was the CEO that took them through the financial crisis in 2009 and 2010. He was the CEO. He was the one at the helm. Okay. Well, they have, you know, when, when, when they were going through the financial crisis, the whole financial crisis was built on uh, the, the reason that it was such a huge collapse was because they had bundled mortgages and Goldman Sachs was one of the main Wall Street for, firms that bundled the mortgages. And, um, and that was what a huge part of what they were, they called them derivatives where they would put all these bad mortgages in to a big bundle and then sell the bundle and pretend and they would get ratings agencies to, to declare that they were AAA rated when they knew that they were co completely trash mortgages. So anyway, so earlier this year, um, you've seen, like you've seen Warren Buffett, a lot of these old school guys, you've seen Warren Buffett, you've seen Bill Gates, and Lloyd Blankfein was another one of these guys who, who never would embrace the, um, the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin and, and all that. And this I'm showing you right here on the screen right now is just, this was just one of the times recently, I believe, that he said it's not, Bitcoin is not for me. Well. I personally don't believe uh, don't believe that it's any coincidence that this year, um, because Goldman Sachs, uh, as you're going to see in a minute, as you've already heard, Goldman Sachs knows where, what the opportunity is in cryptocurrency, and they see the writing on the wall. And the, I don't believe it's one. Co I don't believe it's any coincidence whatsoever that they announced this year that Lloyd Blankfein is preparing to exit Goldman Sachs. They want, and this is my opinion, I believe that they want someone who's not just smart like Lloyd Blankfein is, but also who has a little bit more of a future, future looking um, attitude and who, who does believe in cryptocurrency. And so uh, this, uh, I noticed this, sorry, that was my phone. I noticed this uh, article, um, right when he announced that he was leaving, not the one you're looking at, but this one, one of the first articles I saw come out was Goldman Sachs, David M. to become the CEO, good news for the crypto world. And then it goes on to explain that this is a much more crypto friendly CEO. And they, they, then they mentioned that Goldman Sachs had gone ahead and carried out their first hire in crypto uh, currency in this article. And I don't think that it's a mistake that I don't think that this is a coincidence that that they all of a sudden say, oh, well, this guy's crypto friendly. Well, go figure. OK, so let's tie this this together and look at what Goldman's been doing since. Um, well, this is back to what I was telling you before. And remember, Goldman Sachs was at ground zero of cause. One of, they were one of the major parties that caused the financial crisis in 2009. And they were bailed out. And not only that, but once they had bundled all of these bad mortgages and sold them to their customers, then they turned around and betted. And that's what this article is about. They actually betted against those bad mortgages that they had sold to their clients, knowing that they were bad, <laughs> which is amazing. And then, of course, none of them went to jail. But that's not what I'm trying to go over with you. What I'm, what I'm trying to paint for you is... When the, the big money people of the world come into something, in this case, cryptocurrencies, it is inevitable. I, it's, I think it's human nature. You will have a bubble at some point. You don't, you're, you're not even, we're not even close to a bubble, and they all know it, and they've been saying, oh, is cryptocurrency a bubble? They're just doing that to keep the prices down until they can actually be the ones who create the bubble, which they will do over time, not anytime soon. It'll take them a few years. You and I, because we were in this game before any of these guys showed up, and they really haven't showed up yet, we will, we will benefit from the bubble that they create, and we'll be out long before that if you play this smart and don't get too greedy. But the point is, is that I wanted to show you, this is what they did back uh, in the financial crisis in packaging these mortgages. And the reason I want to show you is because they're going to do the exact same thing with cryptocurrencies, and you're going to make a lot of money off of it in the short, in the short to mid run. Now, over time, 
they'll create a collapse with that just like they did with the internet bubble, just like they did with the financial crisis and the mortgages. It'll be the same thing because history repeats, tends to repeat itself when there's, when there's money and greed involved, especially. Um, this, so, so this was earlier this year, Goldman Sachs is going to open a Bitcoin trading operation. And I think at that time they were just talking in terms of having, doing futures or something like that. And then today, um, I saw this article. Now, Goldman Sachs it back is one of the backers of Circle. Circle just bought Poloniex. And now this article today is talking about how um, Circle, they've got a 30% uptick in institutional investors that are coming on with them. And talk, they're talking about how the demand is really taking off. Now, you and I both know that there's a lot of manipulation that's going on in the market right now. And these are the types of reasons that that manipulation is going on because Goldman Sachs and, and trust me, Goldman Sachs will lead it all. Everybody will follow them. Everybody from E-Trade to um, whoever's out there, Merrill Lynch or whoever, they'll all follow. If you see Goldman Sachs do it, the others will eventually do it or they're already doing it. So, um, this was the circle article from today. And, but what I really want to show you is this, because this is how crazy this world is. This article, Goldman Sachs is exploring crypto derivatives, says C -E -C -O -O. So after the financial crisis, after all of that, they're going to, they're going to explore, explore doing derivatives, uh, with, with cryptocurrencies. Now for you and I right now, for, for those of you that, that have your digital currencies right now, this is a gold mine. I mean, what they're fixing to do. And if, and, it, and, and I'm not saying that derivatives themselves are horrible, but when everybody gets too greedy and the, and, and everybody starts getting paid the way that it happened in the financial crisis, yeah, it becomes a really bad thing, but I'm not saying it'll happen here, but I'm betting you that it will. Eventually, over time, this will become as much of a mess as, it, as the internet bubble did and as the financial crisis did because greed will take over. But I tell you all of this to say that if you're in the game now, if you're one of us and you're in the game now, this is what you're, what, you're way ahead of even Goldman Sachs. If you invested now or, or in the last uh, couple of years in cryptocurrencies, we beat them to the punch, and that's how rare this opportunity is, and that's why I wanted to go over this. Okay, um, I am the digital asset investor, and, but I'm not, I'm not an investment advisor. This is all for entertainment purposes only. I want you all to please subscribe, if you would, and, if, and tell your friends about my channel and hit the like button as much as you can. I would really appreciate it. I really appreciate I hit 4,000 subscribers last night, and um, I hit over... I believe it was over 900 followers on uh, Twitter as well. So go, you can go to my Twitter as well and and follow me there. I post every time I put an art, a, a video up. And so and also um, for those of you that haven't listened to me before, and for those of you who haven't gotten it before, I've said before I'll keep saying it till I'm blue in the face. Um, if if you want to be in the most secure place that you can that you can. For your cryptocurrencies, the Ledger Nano S is a hard wallet. It's cold off storage that you personally have and offline storage, that is. All right. Well, I appreciate it.